The first question is about the new oral anticoagulants. Do you know when or if Prodaxa will be available for DVT patients? Is it available now? Prodaxa is available. Um, it has been approved for atrial fibrillation, irregular heartbeat. It can be used off-label in the non-FDA approved indication DVT-PE. Um, it's the same dose that's available for atrial fibrillation. So yes, it can be used and it is available in the U.S. Of, and in other countries for DVT-PE. But as I discussed, I would not use it widely at this point as it is a new drug. I want to learn a little bit more about it. I'd like the FDA to review the DVT and PE trials. Okay, our next question is, what is meant by the term extensive DVT? And a related question is, what does it mean when my doctor says acute DVT versus chronic DVT? Good question. So the extensive DVT or extensive PE is commonly used by the clinicians who look at the clot and say, whoa, this is quite large but it does not necessarily correlate with clinical symptoms. Um, people may have a very extensive, big uh, anatomical clot in the leg and yet relatively little symptoms. Similarly, the pulmonary embolism can be in the large pulmonary vessels and yet there are relatively few clinical symptoms. So the term extensive is not really a good term. It's not clearly defined. The term acute, acute DVT or acute PE, typically means that the clot occurred within the last two weeks or so, maybe four weeks, and then after that it becomes firm, attached to the blood vessel wall, becomes scar tissue, the risk for breaking off is much less, and it becomes more chronic clot, or better term would be chronic scar tissue. Okay, our next question. Is it safe to have a child after one has had a DVT and PE? Are there any special considerations or medications I should know about? Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, safe is always relative, but in general, anyone, any woman who has had a DVT-PE, um, yes, certainly pregnancy is a good possibility, and for most women, it's safe. Um, however, in most instances, we would give some blood thinner. And that's typically the injections of the low molecular weight heparins, the Lovenox kind of drugs uh, that would be given throughout the pregnancy and then in the postpartum period as well. Certainly depends on the individual patient. Was it a massive life-threatening clot? Is there a strong underlying clotting disorder? So there are a few patients where pregnancy may not be a good choice. But in the majority of women with previous DVTP pregnancy, can be safe if one gives appropriate anticoagulation therapy throughout pregnancy. Okay, our next question is, am I able to feel a clot in my calf? Uh, sometimes I feel something moving. Am I able to feel a clot when it moves from becoming a DVT to a PE? So that's difficult. Uh, a calf DVT is a pretty small a clot. Um, but a number of patients with calf DVT have symptoms. They have their calf pain, swelling, maybe not warmth, but maybe they do. And it can be a very diffuse and mild pain and discomfort. Um, if the clot breaks off, typically patients don't feel that. Um, I've heard that sensation described before, but it's difficult to what to make out of that. But the patient may experience sudden onset of chest pain or shortness of breath, and that would indicate that indeed a DVT may have broken off and caused the PE. The problem is many calf symptoms, uh, pain here and there, is not due to a DVT. So the question is when does one worry about a DVT and get checked out for it, and when does one just ignore it? And then it comes back to the risk factors we mentioned earlier. If the patient has risk factors, is on birth control pill, is um, overweight, has a family history, had a recent long distance travel or surgery, the suspicions increase, the person certainly should seek out medical attention. Okay, our next question. When you were talking about post-thrombotic syndrome, um, you mentioned that the pain and swelling can become long-term for a DVT. Can those symptoms also become long-term after a PE? Yeah, good question as well. I skipped that for time reasons, but um, 
occasionally it can. Most people with a PE recover completely. The lung has a lot of enzymes that, that dissolve blood clots, so the majority of people with PE um, do fine afterwards and recover. But there are people, 10%, maybe a little less, who develop chronic damage to the lung, and that's called pulmonary hypertension, uh, where the damage leads to increased pressure in the lung, then the heart needs to pump against it, the heart eventually tires out. And those people have um, either they don't recover completely from a PE, they have chronic shortness of breath, they have chronic fatigue, they can't really do what they want to do. And in those people, we think about uh, pulmonary hypertension. The way to check it out is, number one, to listen and uh, assess the symptoms, but number two, to put a pulse oximeter, the clip on the patient's finger in clinic, measure the pulse oxygen, then walk the patient one, two, three flights of stairs rapidly and see what happens to the oxygen on this machine. And then if it's abnormal, we get a cardiac echo to look for right heart strain, and then maybe refer the patient to a more extensive workup through the pulmonologist, the right heart cath, and pressure measurements. This topic is also discussed more in detail on the Clot Connect patient blog uh, under pulmonary hypertension. Okay, and we've had several questions that are on a similar topic, so I'm going to group them together. Uh, one is, I've had a clot in 2010, but my calf still bothers me. I'm wearing the compression stockings daily. Is it normal to still have pain a year later? And then a related question is, I had a PE. My doctor says I should be better, but I'm not. How long does it take to recover before I'll feel like my old self again? Yeah, so that's the issue that some people recover quickly and others uh, recover more slowly over weeks to months and some people will always have some symptoms and in the situation that you described, some leg DVT in 2010 that still has some calf pain, that sounds like post-thrombotic syndrome, that's chronic pain and if that doesn't improve further, it has plateaued, I would not expect that this would improve further. In the case of the PE patient that you mentioned, if there is uh, no complete recovery, well, then we start to think about the pulmonary hypertension that I mentioned, and then appropriate workup is needed. And as mentioned, up to maybe 10% of people will have this chronic lung damage and not complete recovery, and that needs to be worked up. Okay, an additional question is, are there any natural dietary alternatives to either treat or prevent blood clots? Any special diets or supplements that you know of that can prevent recurrence? Good question as well, and commonly asked, there's nothing that's established as a natural product that prevents DVT or PEs, or that could be taken instead of warfarin. So if, if a patient takes anything, I would not build on it, on, or rely on it having any protective effect. Now, I'm going to return the question, do you think that um, garlic or ginkgo or vitamin E would be beneficial in preventing DVT-PEs? And you will say, no, we learned that those act on platelets and they may be beneficial on arterial clot prevention, but platelets do not play much of a role in vein clots, so vitamin E, ginkgo, garlic uh, wouldn't be beneficial for DVT-PE. Some people think um, or take natto kinase, there's been a lot of um, activity on the web by uh, people selling the products and um, we don't know whether it has any clinical benefit. I don't have a problem with patients taking it um, if they're not on warfarin, um, but I don't know whether it works. And clearly I would not recommend that somebody come off warfarin and instead build on natokinase as protectant from blood clots.